This talk is Liberating the Debugging Experience with the GDB Python API, and I'm Jeff Troll. Okay, there we go. I have to stand near my computer, I guess. All right, so first a little bit about me. I was a hardware person for a long time doing microprocessors. I went from there into electronic CAD, and from that into C++ programming, and I'm now doing independent consulting. I am the organizer of the San Francisco Emacs Meetup Group. So if, if any of you like Emacs, tomorrow at 8 a.m., ah, uh, boo, yeah. Uh, tomorrow at 8 a.m., we're gonna have a, a birds of a feather session. So I hope you can all make it to that if you're interested. And finally, I'm available for your projects. General theme of the talk, actually twofold. First of all, tools are, full, are a force multiplier it's worth it to take a portion of your team, a portion, portion of your time, and build tools that help the rest of the team accelerate their work. Secondly, GDB is powerful, and Python has a rich ecosystem of modules, and when you put the two of them together, you can make some amazing tools, and I hope to show you some of those today. General outline of my talk. First of all, I'm gonna go over some very basic Python stuff including just the beginnings of the GDB Python API. Then we're gonna dive into four different applications. For each one of those applications, I'm gonna introduce a problem area. I'm going to talk about uh, some GDB Python API area that might be able to help it. Then most of the time, I'm also going to bring in an external Python module that can, in combination with the GDB API, solve the problem. Then we'll do a little demo and then we'll wrap up. So first of all, just enough Python. I gotta stand closer to this computer. Uh, basic stuff, first of all. Python is white space sensitive. I think that's probably the most famous thing about Python. Indentation is used to indicate blocks, so this is your basic if-then statement. There's no curly braces. Classes in Python, I put the same class as a C++ class and a Python class here to make it a little bit easier to understand. In this example, I've got uh, a member function, some member data, and uh, the equivalent of a constructor. Also, both of these classes are derived from a base class called base. You're gonna find that this is a common pattern when you're using the GDB Python API. You take a class, derive from it, and then override some member function to accomplish your goal. Python and GDB. So to access Python, you just type Python, and then you can put a lot of things after it. You can do a one line of code. Here we reverse a list. You can do multiple lines where you just type everything, hit Python, type in Python, then enter all the lines you want, and then end, and it runs all of those lines together as a single script. You can also load and import your own scripts if you specify the Python path right. Very basic GDB API usage. Everything that we can normally do on the command line can also be done with a function called gdb.execute. And you just give as a string the same stuff you would have typed on the command line. You can capture the output as well. And then parse it if you want. And that's one way to interact with, with the API. But it's not really the best way. A better way is to use the richer stuff in the API that gives you strongly typed, well, maybe that's that's the wrong word for Python, but gives you like objects back with methods and stuff like that. For example, the GDB parse and eval method, if you supply an expression, it gives you something called a GDB value back. And you can do things like get the address of the value or the type of the value. You can convert it to a plain Python type as well. So let's dive into a few applications. The first one I wanna talk about is improving stack traces. Backtraces in C++ can be pretty confusing. They tend to expose library internals. Often the function signatures, because we have all these, these uh, types are expanded in the template arguments, they can be very, very verbose. They, they also can have, uh, they can also show you the internal calls within the library that are maybe too much information for someone who's, who's um, just trying to figure out what's wrong with their code. So this is a goal I have for this application, is to take the normal things that you see in the backtrace and shrink some of those verbose names down. 
and then to eliminate stack frames that are internal to libraries. Does anybody know what this type is? std string, that's right. I know, we know it now, but like, and, and only for lib std c++. But it's, it's the first time you see it, it's like, oh my god. And if you have like a vector of these things with allocators, it just, it becomes very messy. The tools we can use from the API to help solve this problem are, first of all, frame decorators, which can change how each frame is displayed. Secondly, frame filters, which we can use to remove frames that are not interesting to us, like frames that are inside of library calls. First of all, decorators. You can change the appearance of any frame. Uh, in this case, we are making a decorator that inherits, uh, this is that pattern I described earlier, we're inheriting from GDB frame decorator, and we're overriding a member function, in this case, the one that prints the name of the function. This particular decorator transforms the original name of the function by running rot13 on it. So this is a good trick to play on your coworkers. Frame filtering, you can remove frames that you don't want to see. For example, if anyone didn't want to see anything from boost and their backtraces, this code would work. So we're going to, to solve the original problem, we're gonna take decorators to you, and we're gonna build a decorator that uses regexes to take, to simplify the complex expanded types in the backtrace to show, that, to make a, a more concise uh, function name. We're also going to use the filter to eliminate everything except the original call to the standard library. So here's our demo. The example program I'm going to use is a broken sort. We're trying here to sort vectors of vectors of strings based on a lexicographic compare on the first string in each vector, uh, sorry, the first two strings in each vector. And the, so we're using std sort and supplying our own comparator, it's just that it's wrong. And so if we're using the debugger to debug this, we may not have the best time the way it is, the way things are right now. So here's our std sort call. We want to get down inside this lambda, so that's line 33, so let's place a breakpoint on line 33 and continue. All right, great, we're, we're at our lambda, we're finally back into our code, we've passed through the standard library. Now let's see what that backtrace looks like. Uh-oh. So many allocators. Oh, oh, that's so painful. Okay, now let's apply, let's apply our code, our frame decorator and our frame filter. and see what that looks like now. Aw, oh, yeah. We've taken four frames out of here that were internal to std sort. We've also uh, changed the names a little bit so that we just have std vector of std vector of string instead of that giant thing that expanded. So I think that's a big improvement. Okay, next application, better stepping. Often we supply, just like we saw, we supply our, our own code to a standard, to a library um, in order to, to, for it to use. And so in order to, to see our code, in order to get to our code and see what might be wrong with it, we have to step through a whole lot of, of library code to get there. We can do like I just did and set a breakpoint in the middle of our Lambda or our visitor or whatever we're supplying to the algorithm but it's, it's really painful and we might miss stuff and so on. So we wanna have some way of doing that automatically. The tools we can use from the API for this, breakpoint is, is basically the main function that we're going to use. It's going to help us by creating temporary breakpoints just like I did manually. To, to make a breakpoint through the API, it's the main, uh, interface is gdb.breakpoint, you can use the same kind of strings that you used on the command line to indicate breakpoints. You can also take those breakpoints and then because they're, they're real objects, you can then manipulate them. You can enable or disable them. You can add a condition. You can even put commands on that breakpoint that will execute when the breakpoint is hit. For example, in this case, when the breakpoint is hit, 
you'll get a pop-up YouTube window showing a video of Steve Ballmer. We also have finish breakpoints, which is one of my favorite features. When you type finish on the command line in GDB and you're inside some function, it jumps to the end of the function. And it does that behind the scenes by creating breakpoints at the, at the exit points of the function. And, but you don't normally, you're not normally able to add commands and stuff like that to it. But you can do it through the Python API, and we're gonna do that later. The Python module that we're gonna apply to this is actually libclang. This is a way to insert semantic information about your running program, which GDB doesn't normally have any idea about. And we're gonna put these together and use that to figure out where we should be inserting breakpoints. So libclang's Python bindings allow you to find the current statement, given a file name and a line number, to identify calls, objects with methods, and even lambdas that you supplied within them. What we're gonna do then is figure out which of those are library calls and which of those are calls to our code. Actually, there'll be anything that's not a library call. Then we'll use GDB to set temporary breakpoints on that user code so that we can continue straight through to it. Putting it all together. Connecting GDB to libclang, we can access the current frame from GDB. We can then ask the frame what the current file and line number are. With that information then, we can go over to libclang, give, it, give that to, to libclang and have it give us what's called a cursor into the AST, that's the abstract syntax tree, the semantic information describing your running program. From there, from the cursor, we can ask questions about everything kind of downstream in the tree, including things like calls to our code and so forth. And finally, we're gonna, we're gonna fake single step by creating and removing breakpoints. So having all this information about the downstream stuff from libclang, we can then go make these breakpoints, run continue, and then delete all the breakpoints, and it'll be as though we had just sort of magically single stepped through all the library code. We're gonna use the previous example again with the lambda and the sort. Let's see here. All right, let's, let's see what stepping into this looks like without our functionality. Not good. Okay, let's run again. Okay, now we're at, we're at sort and I will import our special command. And this is, this is the special command I defined. Let's see what happens. Oh yeah, there we are right in the middle of the lambda. So it worked. Next example, finding leaks. I don't know if any of you have had this experience where you've been trying to persuade other people at your company to adopt some more modern techniques and you said, no raw pointers. And they said, and one day they came back to you and they said, I've done it. I've replaced all the raw pointers with shared pointer. And the program doesn't crash anymore, but it does run out of memory. <laughs> and so you think, okay, yeah, I kind of I kind of know maybe what's going on there. There's probably some kind of circular reference problem. This is common enough that I think it's helpful to make a tool to to, to help us figure out what's going on in cases like that. Now the tool, interestingly, well, one tool that we can use, an external tool, is Valgrin. And I don't know, unless, did any of you go to Fred's talk yesterday? I'm sorry, I'm thinking about Greg Law's talk on Tuesday. We'll bring up Fred later. Um, Valgrin actually can mimic a GDB server. So you can actually connect to it with a GDB client, and then it adds features. So I'll show how this works. We start Valgrin in server mode like this. And then we start GDB and we connect to that server. Once we do that, we now have a regular kind of looking GDB, except we now have these extra commands. We have commands available through monitor. We've got leak check, block list, and who points at. 
Unfortunately, there's no Python API for these, so we're gonna do what I talked about earlier, run GDB execute, parse the output. So now we have, uh, from the monitor commands, we have information on blocks of allocated memory and the pointers that they have to other blocks. This can be visualized as a directed graph. And we already know from, from um, graph algorithms that if we have a directed graph, we can find loops within it in, in a, some, with, with some well-known algorithms. I'm going to use a Python module called Graph Tool, which is actually a bound version of Boost Graph, uh, bound into Python and with, with some extra features. So the way it's gonna work is I'm gonna start with a block that we know that has leaked. We're going to then ask through the monitor commands what other blocks are, or what other pointers and what other blocks are pointing to that block. And then incrementally add onto the graph. So we get this big directed graph, which gives us all of, the, all of the pointers and references that are going on in our leaked blocks. Then we'll run the depth first search algorithm on it. And when we re-encounter the same loop again, uh, sorry, the same vertex again, we will know that we have a reference loop and we can use when we record at each vertex where we came from, then we can just read out what the loop was. So let's see how that might work. Here's an example where we've got six blocks and some pointers. We're gonna turn each of those blocks into vertices, and each of those pointers is going to become an edge in the directed graph. We're going to start searching at one block that we know is leaked, and then move through the graph in a depth-first manner. Now, as soon as we encounter a vertex that we've already seen, we know that there's a loop there, and we can simply report them. So let's do a demo. This is my test case for this demo. It's the world's dumbest tasking system. There's just a queue, and on the queue I store functions or functors that take no arguments and return void. And then we sort of go and execute them one at a time. The code that uses this queue adds just one task to the list, which does some work, and then stages up another task. And in order to stage the other task, it keeps a reference to the task list. Unfortunately, as you can see, we forgot to go and actually execute any of the tasks in the task list. And as a result, when we exit the main, we're going to have a task list with references to, to a task which has a reference to the task list. So let's give this a try. Let's see if we can find this with our code. Okay, first I start the Valgren server on my leaky code, and then I start the client. We'll break on main, we'll continue. All right, here we are in main. Let's try running one of those monitor commands. All right, this is just what you normally see from Valgren. It says there aren't any problems yet. Let's go forward here. Let's try it again. Still nothing. Okay, here's the end. Now let's try. Oh yeah, we have leaked. All right, so let's see what those, what those um, whether it can find any reference loops. This command is called print pointer loop. I'm sorry, I should have thought of a better name, but anyway, oh yeah. So we have three blocks out there. Uh, it's probably the task list, the block that, of memory that it allocates, and then the original task itself. So this, this doesn't give you enough information though because it doesn't, does, it's hard to sort of figure out where, that, where the blocks came from, right? So I added another parameter. You can add custom parameters. We'll turn this on, and now it's gonna show us for each one of these blocks where it was allocated with a backtrace. All right, there's the backtrace. So this should be enough information to debug and to figure out where the reference loop is. All right. Final example, visualizing algorithms. I think that most people's code bases contain some critical, super important central piece and then a whole bunch of like other stuff. And what I found is that when we're, when we're debugging our code, uh, we have a bug report or something like that. As, as long as there's nothing like actually erroneous in the input, we find ourselves 
always asking the question, what is that core central piece of, of, of functionality doing? Like, and so often we, we go in and we have to um, turn on logging or there's some if def we have to like set, set the special macro to, to recompile so it has all the extra logging. And then we sit there with these pages and pages of log reports and be like, okay, what's going on here? And you start reading and there's grepping and all that. Trying to, maybe you're drawing a little picture on your desk or something like that. Wouldn't it be nice if we had some visualization tooling for our critical pieces of code and data in the middle of the application? So the goal now is to build a graphical display of an algorithm in action, a simple one. So we're gonna use std sort on a vector for this purpose. From the API, we're just gonna use breakpoints basically. We're gonna use them to drive display updates showing what's happening with the algorithm. We'll use as a module, we'll use the PyQt5 module. This is, surprise, Qt bound into Python. It's really easy to use. Actually, I'm, I'm a longtime user of Qt and I found the Python version much easier. The general approach is I'm gonna take the value type, which is surprise integer, and make special wrapper for it. Then I'm gonna instrument that wrapper so that when something interesting happens, we will create a, we'll have a breakpoint basically. And then we can go and, and update the, the display with, with what just happened. We're gonna use uh, separate threads and then a thread safe queue to communicate. So instrumenting the value class. Basically, what I did was I made it just move only that, that makes two, two fewer things I have to write, I guess, or, or instrument. Um, so we have a move assignment operator and move constructor that I'm going to instrument with breakpoints. And then I also need to do swap. And this is where the finished breakpoint comes in. Um, when you enter swap, we're going to call std swap. And that is implemented with move semantics. So if I didn't then go and disable the move constructor and move assignment operators instrumentation, then we would get all extra, we would get a, a confusing result there. So I'm disabling those, performing the swap, and then at the end I re-enable with a finished breakpoint, because otherwise there's no way to breakpoint after that thing, after swap runs. The, this is sort of the, the system diagram here. We got the running program. It's, it's running under GDB. It's emitting breakpoints. We put them through the thread safe queue. We update the event loop in PyQt. All right, the demo, and this is the code. We're just randomly shuffling it, and then the instrumentation all starts when we start, when we call sort. So let's give this a try. So I brought up Fred. Um, if you saw Fred's talk on sorting yesterday, uh, you would have learned that std sort works by first running intro sort, which does a bunch of exchanges. It says recursive partitioning, and then it does insertion sort to finish up. And that's just what you're gonna see here. I kind of thought that when we got to this point, it would seem surprisingly long. <laughs> and indeed it is. <laughs> it actually runs much faster than this. Almost done. All right, there we go. So back to the slides. All right, so wrapping up. Investing in debug tooling pays off. I truly believe that for teams of more than a few people, reserving some portion of one engineer or several engineers for tool development makes a lot of sense. Focusing on your key data structures and algorithms or focusing on categories of bugs that seem to come up all the time, like we did with the leak. Once you develop a, a body of code that you want, that you want to use to, to make things easier for debugging, you can put them in a specially named file. 
GDB will automatically load them whenever you, you run GDB. So you can make this part of your debug build. Python, generally speaking, it's a game changer because of its vast ecosystem. You can take just anything, really, measuring in the program. Imagine, like, tracking every memory allocation of a lifetime of every block and then doing statistical analysis. I mean, you, you can do just about anything. There are endless possibilities. And so in conclusion, let's go make some tools. Just a short question. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, libclang in Python. Yeah. Do I need to compile my project with Clang in order to use that? So yeah, you, you kind of do, yeah. That's okay. true. It's, it's helpful anyway. You, need a, you also need a comp compilation database. Um, yeah, I can, I can tell you how to do it. Yeah. Okay, it's thanks. not too bad. Uh, I have a question for the demo visualization tool. Yeah. So, for the uh, visualization, can you make it much faster? Because you have to wait to watch all the operations happening. Oh my goodness, yes. I, I throttled it to make it look interesting. Like, otherwise it would just be like this. <laughs> like, like you would literally see a sorted ray and nothing else. So yeah, this is throttled to like five or 600 milliseconds per operation, just, just so that you can see it happening. Thank you. Yeah. I may have missed this because it went by so fast, but. Can you coordinate the uh, smart stepping and the filtering of the backtrace together? That is, can I coordinate so that when I step over something, it will skip the same things that are being filtered out of the backtrace? Oh. Um, they're being filtered out of the backtrace. Yeah, there's, there's, I think so, because there are actually, I made parameters for those and didn't show them, but there's a regex um, that you can you can just like set right there in GDB set blah 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 regex some expression you can set them both to the same thing, yeah. So is there some sort of global store where I can coordinate between the various um, things that I'm writing for GDB? Uh, you you mean I'm not sure what you mean like a repo or. Well, no, I mean, I mean uh, would I have to copy and paste code around, or can I actually ah. centralize it? No, there's, there's a whole, yeah, GDB has all these rules about where it looks for things, and yeah, there's, there's like global directories, there's local ones, you know, it's like the infinitely configurable, as, as you would imagine, yeah. I think it was very useful to see that um, shorter output about the templated string type and I wonder if that's going to be possible to add the same kind of uh, pre-processing to Clang, because let's say you compile a template and there's like, everyone has like 4,000 lines of output and just one single thing which is wrong. So uh, I'm not sure, I think it would be a useful feature to add, but I'm not sure if that's possible if Clang has this kind of uh, Python interface to, uh, to, to write an extension. Uh, do, you, do you mean to improve the error output from Clang? Yeah, I mean, Clang is like outputting, I, I'm not, yeah, we could call it improve, but just to make it shorter, to, to make the debugging, uh, not debugging, but compiling at least, like faster, the, the process, because going, re reading all these messages is, uh, it takes a lot of time. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, Clang is pretty hackable. So, but good demo. Oh, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, I guess that's it then. Thanks for coming. <laughs>